Hello, everyone, and good evening, and welcome to Moffitt's Facebook Live event focusing on clinical trials in our breast program. Tonight, I am your host, and my name is Steve Blanchard. I'm part of the public relations team here at Moffitt Cancer Center, and I'm excited uh, for tonight's event. Um, it is uh, the Office of Community Outreach, Engagement, and Equity in partnership with Moffitt's Breast Program uh, that is bringing this first of four Life Project Facebook Live events. The Life Project stands for Learning About the Impact of Breast Health Education Facebook Live Event, L-I-F-E. This project is funded by the Florida Breast Cancer Foundation to provide breast health education across the cancer continuum from prevention all the way to survivorship. Now, this evening's event will invite you, introduce you to clinical trials and explain why they are beneficial and are a viable treatment option for some breast cancer patients. Um, of course, I'm not the expert on that, but I have an amazing panel here to answer those questions and to tell us a little bit more. Um, our panelists this evening are Dr. Hayden Solomon, who is the medical director of Moffitt's Clinical Trials Office, Dr. Heather Hahn, who is the breast medical oncologist and breast clinical trials lead, Ms. Vivian Sifones, uh, Moffitt's Clinical Trial Navigation Educator, and Ms. Melissa Miller, uh, who is a Moffitt breast cancer patient, and she is currently enrolled in a clinical trial, and we'll hear about her experience. Uh, I want to remind everybody who has tuned in that as we listen to our panel, uh, please feel free to drop any questions that you may have in the comments below, uh, below the video, and we will do our best to answer as many of those as we can during the conversation and at the end of the broadcast. Um, so please be patient after you put those questions in, we'll do our best to get to everybody. So enough about me talking, let's get this started. And to do that, I would like to turn to Dr. Solomon. Uh, welcome Dr. Solomon, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Steve, thanks for setting this up. Oh, of course. Um, now to start off, um, since we are discussing clinical trials, uh, can you tell me a little bit about, about why clinical trials research is so important? Clinical research is the cornerstone of how we as physicians and researchers and scientists uh, improve and advance the state of care for, for patients with various diseases. And cancer patients are definitely no exception to that rule. Uh, pretty much every treatment that a patient has undergone in order to try to treat their uh, cancer has gone through some kind of testing. Uh, as part of a clinical trial so that we could develop the type of evidence and information that we as physicians need in order to be able to make recommendations to our patients that a particular treatment's effective and safe and appropriate for their breast cancer. And then furthermore, if we don't have robust participation from patients on clinical trials, in essence, the uh, standard of care, if you will, stagnates and we can't advance treatments by incorporating new therapies or new approaches because we don't have a, a, an evidence-based way to test whether those new approaches are any better than what we're doing already. So critical trials are absolutely essential for us to continue to work on improving outcomes for our patients. And without them, we'd basically be stuck uh, in the same mode of treatment uh, pretty much indefinitely. Right, and, and I know that Moffitt has an ongoing commitment to conducting innovative clinical trial research. Um, how is that done exactly um, from, from your perspective? How is that, um, uh, how is that commitment uh, undertaken by researchers at Moffitt? There's a variety of different activities throughout Moffitt uh, that researchers participated in order to try to advance the, the state of breast cancer care and, and other cancer care at the center. So you have trials which basically are in some cases uh, observational trials where they're just trying to look at how patients are doing um, over time, for example, and trying to look at uh, different aspects of their disease or their lifestyles or other factors to try to see if there are any associations. There are some trials that are supportive care trials where uh, the intent isn't necessarily to directly treat the disease, but they're looking for ways to better support patients through their journey with cancer. And then we also have interventional studies, which is uh, what myself and Dr. Han primarily focus on, is that we like to look at investigating new treatments, particularly novel drugs, because I'm a medical oncologist alongside Dr. Han, who's my colleague in the clinic. We tend to focus on new medical therapies. However, we have trials that also look at new surgical approaches, new radiation treatments, 
and also new devices or surgical techniques as well. And generally all of these different interventional trials, they usually fall under uh, two main buckets. One is a type of trial where say it may have been proposed by an outside sponsor or a company that's trying to develop a new therapy and bring it to market. And they may approach Moffitt and our investigators with our expertise in our patient population to try to test those therapies out and try to see if we can get a new approval for those treatments in order for them to be delivered into the community. Uh, but another common trial scenario, and that's a very important one for us, is that we have many trials that are initiated by our own investigators. So we actually come up with the idea internally and we pitch those ideas to the companies, providing them the data that they need to be able to agree and say that this is a good idea. And then they support us with uh, drugs or funding or other means of support so that we can carry out those groundbreaking investigational initiated studies that we call them, uh, where basically we are the ones that uh, innovate the trial from the, from the get-go. And that's kind of some of the main classes of interventional treatments that we would do at Moffitt. Right. And, and, and to clarify, these trials are held on Moffitt's campus. I mean, you, it, it, the patients that participate are treated in the same way, in the same place that all patients are treated, correct? Absolutely. So the goal is to try to incorporate these trials and weave them into our clinical uh, paradigm, if you will, our, our, our pathways and kind of the way that we, we look at patients is that we always want to prioritize if a trial is appropriate for them, we want to try to offer those trials to them at the time they're being seen by their oncologists and so that they can make the best informed decision for themselves about whether they would want to participate in a clinical trial or to undergo treatment with a standard of care therapy. So it's critical for us to have that ability to offer patients uh, who come in the door a, a quick and, and uh, relatively efficient evaluation to figure out if a clinical trial is right for them. Okay. And, and, uh, and thank you for, for that explanation. And of course, again, I want to remind um, everybody who has tuned in and is and is watching that you can ask questions in the comment section, uh, and I'll do my best to relay, relay those questions to our experts uh, here. Um, and uh, we do have uh, one viewer who um, has asked, uh, what do you need to qualify for a clinical trial? That's what Casey would like to know. Is that something you can answer, Dr. Solomon? Yes, absolutely. So um, in general, for us to know whether a patient would qualify for a clinical trial, we want to get their information and records from their various providers that participated either in their diagnosis of their cancer or have provided care for their uh, cancer prior to coming to the uh, center. So that way we can put together an entire picture and history of the type of breast cancer, for example, that they've been diagnosed with. Uh, what subtype is it? What type of treatments have they had? And then also getting their medical information so we can see what kind of medical conditions they have and also other eligibility criteria to determine whether or not they're suitable. And when we get all that information provided to us, uh, myself or doctors like Dr. Han typically will review these uh, records and screen patients to look to see if they are medically appropriate for inclusion in the studies based on the criteria that are in the protocol. So. That's some of the information that we need in order to determine if a patient is eligible for a study. But obviously the final determination is when they have that face-to-face -face visit with their provider in the clinic. That's really what ultimately kind of determines eligibility. Okay, and that makes sense having that conversation with, with your oncologist, with your, with your cancer specialist. Now, I wanna to turn to Dr. Dr. Heather Hahn. Um, I know, of course, you are very involved in, in clinical trials as well. And I wondered if you could share with us um, some details about a current clinical trial to kind of give us a picture of, of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yes, so in Moffitt, throughout the years, we have had multiple clinical trials for treatment for patients with breast cancer. So we do have patients with early stage um, trials and also for patients with advanced stage, um, so-called metastatic disease. So we are focused on um, patients with early stage with a treatment called neoadjuvant therapy. So when patients are diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, some of the patients are candidate to receive systemic therapy such as chemotherapy prior to surgery to see how this treatment works to shrink the tumor and to decide uh, for their best treatment following surgery. So at Mafid, currently we have 
vaccine study for patients with HER2 positive early stage breast cancer that's used in conjunction with the standard chemotherapy and HER2 therapy. And then we have treatment um, conjunction with the nationwide group um, at uh, UCSF and others called iSpy2 that incorporate multiple uh, medications such as immunotherapy in addition to chemotherapy. So those trials are open for patients who are just diagnosed with breast cancer and you might be eligible for those clinical trials that are ongoing at Moffitt. And we also have a patient who completed already treatment with the breast cancer with the surgery and chemotherapy and to see what else we can do to increase the, ch increase the chance of cure by using immunotherapy such as vaccine studies. So we have one such trial for patients with HER2 positive breast cancer all this stage who completed the treatment and you might be eligible for vaccine study to boost your immune system for HER2 cells and to prevent cancer and recurrent disease and obviously to improve the chance of cure. And in addition to these clinical trials for all this stage, we have several trials for patients who has metastatic disease uh, for depending on subtypes such as triple negative, HER2 positive, or ER positive. We have many trials specifically targeting your subtypes of disease to improve the uh, outcome such as delaying progression and sometimes also to improve quality of life while going through the treatment. So we have many trials that's ongoing. And of course, you, you have a front row seat to see how these trials help patients and also improve research. Uh, we had a Facebook viewer, Sarah, ask us, um, and I believe she said that she had been on a trial before. How do you convince or um, talk to a patient about joining a clinical trial? Because I know a lot of people are hesitant about that. Um, um, how do you help them know that that's something that you consider? Mm -hmm. So I want to actually emphasize and echoing what Dr. Solomon previously says, the importance of research, how much we um, advance the treatment of breast cancer, why we are one step closer to cure of breast cancer is through all the research. Obviously, if we don't do any research, there will be no change and no improvement. Only with the research, we can only get one step closer to improve the chance of cure. And I heard this slogan from one of the research foundations saying, the end of cancer begins with you. That you including you as a patient by participating, you as myself and scientists and clinicians designing the research to answer specific questions that we have sometimes to understand about breast cancer or sometimes to find a better treatment um, to, so nobody dies from uh, of breast cancer. So that's kind of our goal at the end of the day. So it's not just to be convincing patient, but patient also has to be motivated to be participating, to make a differences for their own journey and for potentially future other patient to help to move this field forward. So our common goal that cancer no, no no longer cancer will kill many women or men um, in everywhere in the world so uh, it's a rather uh, decision that we make together and you will hear more from also patients who will be uh, participating today in this um, meeting as well and, and i'm glad you you mentioned that because uh, this research is uh, cumulative um, as in you know the research we do now helps you know the next generation or, or, or looking ahead and, and the and the folks involved right now um i know i believe that there's a repository on uh, moffitt.org of clinical trials that are currently happening um but um we have a facebook viewer cheryl uh was wondering if if you're aware of any trials for the the BRCA1 breast cancer uh jean do we have clinical trials for that going on currently that's uh for BRCA, yes, we do have a few trials, but one main trial we have, we are working with National Cancer Institute, so NCI. So they have a clinical trial open in many centers, so about 10 centers across the United States. And we are one of center participating patient who has a germline BRCA1 or 2 mutation, but with metastatic breast cancer. That PARP inhibitor called Talazoparib or Olaparib have been already approved over the past uh, few years for patients with this patient population. But this research specifically trying to address adding immunotherapy 
two PARP inhibitor could even make a more impact on their outcome. So this research is ongoing at Moffitt. And we also have another trial at Moffitt using PARP inhibitor for patients with BRCA or other uh, germline or other mutations that PARP inhibitor might be effective because it's not just a BRCA1-2. There are many other mutations that we find uh, similar to BRCA from tumor or patient's germline uh, from their blood that they might be eligible for this uh, clinical trial as well that's open through our early phase clinical trial unit. And, and, and I know that anybody listening to all of this um, uh, can get overwhelmed uh, because there is a lot of information out there regarding uh, breast cancer treatment, diagnoses, and of course, clinical trials, um, which is why uh, another uh, amazing thing at, about Moffitt is that we have team members on board who help patients understand that process. And uh, um, we have more questions coming in, but before I got to those, I wanted to introduce everybody to uh, Vivian Sifantes. And hopefully I'm saying that right. We had that conversation okay. before we were live. Yes. Um, uh, you are a clinical trials navigator educator at Moffitt, or navigation educator at Moffitt, excuse me. Um, in layman's terms, what does that mean? What do you do? Well, it's, uh, it's not complicated at all. The title is complex, but my job is very uh, beautiful. I educate people on what clinical trials are, and I navigate uh, specific patients within the system of Moffitt to make sure they receive the care that they need, the breaking all the barriers that they present at the time of referral to us. So it's, it's really um, a really fun job to do. Now, you, of course, are, are based, well, pre-COVID, you're likely based at the Cancer Center. Um, how does your job transfer to the community? How do people find you to know that you, you are that resource? Well, originally, I found people. I went out <laughs> to make myself known and <laughs> to let them know that I existed. So they quickly, uh, approached me eventually for my services. And uh, now I'm very well known in the community. I'm linked to a lot of um, partners who request uh, my services, which are presentations out in the community in uh, health fairs or meetings of mm, community uh, groups that gather together to uh, help the community at large by educating in different uh, topic, topics, including obviously cancer prevention and clinical trials. And, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, prevention clinical trials, of course, which is what we're talking about here tonight. Uh, what does that educational workshop look like? I mean, is it like a slide deck presentation? Is it guest speakers? What, what can people expect when they attend those? It depends. I do have, obviously, PowerPoint presentations, but I tend to do more of a fun kind of presentation to make people um, engage and uh, more interested in the subject. Um, as I've learned, a lot of mm, people in the community are not very, um, the, the clinical trial term is not very well known. So when I bring it to them, I put it in very simple terms so they can understand it and open their minds to receiving the information I bring to them. So I make it a little bit of fun uh, with sometimes a combination of the PowerPoint and a lot of talking. And a lot of uh, you know, sharing my personal experience as a uh, survivor and participant of a clinical trial myself in the past. So, and, and, and you know, when you're a survivor and share your story, I'm sure it's it's very impactful, uh, very relatable to those who are experiencing this. Um, for those who are have not been um, lucky enough to attend one of your your educational events or who don't know you, um, what is the best way for them to get contacted with you to learn when they can participate? They can dial my extension at 813-745-3952. Well, that is very direct, and that's fantastic. <laughs> so that's, that's perfect. Um, so anybody listening, you know, you, you can get a hold of Vivian right, right away to learn about those uh, workshops. Um, and like you said, you're a breast cancer survivor. Um, and I think that having that unique uh, unique vantage point is hugely helpful in the field that you that you're in. Um, but I think it's also very very uh, helpful that we have a, another breast cancer survivor with us on the call today, uh, Melissa Miller, um, who is a breast cancer patient uh, at Moffitt. And uh, Melissa, if you don't mind briefly, um, can you tell me a little bit about your cancer journey? When when were you diagnosed, and how long have you been a patient at Moffitt? 
So I'll, I'll give you the um, the snippet points. Um, I was diagnosed in um, the beginning of 2019, three weeks before my wedding, and um, got married and started chemo um, three days after I was married. So and it's been um, it's been a long two years. Um, I'm I'm <laughs> nearing the end of it. So. Um, yeah, I actually uh, did my treatments in Orlando. I did my chemotherapy and my radiation in Orlando at Advent Health, who was a partner with Moffitt. And then um, I found out about this trial, um, you know, just doing some research on my own once I realized that I had, or once I learned that I had not had a complete response to chemo. So the, uh, the internet is a beautiful thing, and um, it was very helpful for me to get in touch with Dr. Han and the team over at Moffitt and learn that you know, this was a possibility for me, so. And, and what a what a horrible wedding gift, but I'm glad you're doing so well now. Uh, <laughs> a challenging way to start off uh, off that new adventure in life. Um, now, oh, you yes. said that, that you, you searched yourself to find a, a clinical trial. Um, did you just mm -hmm. Google the type of breast cancer that you had? Uh, how, what was that process like? Um, I Googled HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, um, you know, not complete response or something along those lines. And I just kind of, um, I think actually the first trial that popped up was the one in Moffitt. And I don't know if that's Google's algorithm based on my location being in Orlando. I'm not really sure how all that back end stuff works, but um, I was actually able to find it and I started reading and, you know, there's so many clinical trials out there and it can be overwhelming, but I started reading and I was like, yep, check, check, check. And I started reading all the boxes. So I immediately was, you know, like hitting the keyboard, like, you know, starting to type an email. And um, I don't know if it ends up directly in Dr. Han's inbox or who it goes to, but, um, you know, I think I got a call the very next morning from one of the coordinators who was like ready and willing to talk to me. So the, the response from Moffitt was incredible. I mean, I heard from a human within less than 24 hours. So it was, it was definitely a good feeling to know that, you know, hey, I at least piqued enough interest to, you know, get a call back. So. Right. And, and, and making that decision to enter into a clinical trial can be very, very tough. And, and I was going to ask, ask this question, but we also have a viewer, Anne, um, who is asking this as well. She says that clinical trials can seem scary. Um, you know, what are you allowing to be done to me? Why do I need this? Am I bad off? And, am I that bad off that I need a trial? Um, how, can you talk to a little bit about um, those fears or those questions that you had, Melissa, and how you approach those with, with your caregivers? Absolutely. So um, at the time of my diagnosis, I was 39 and I was not ready to give up without, um, you know, slaying the dragon on every front I possibly could. So um, I acted aggressively. I had a double mastectomy. I went through the radiation. I followed all the protocols that are, you know, standard of care for my um, triple positive breast cancer, but I was stage three. And at my age, I was not going to, you know, just say, okay, you know, um, we're, we're taking those steps. And I said, you know, is there anything else I can do? And, you know, for me, it was a no brainer. I found access to a drug that, you know, increased my uh, chances of not having a recurrence. Um, HER2 positive breast cancer is known to typically rear its ugly head. Uh, not typically, but, you know, there is a good chance that it could rear its ugly head again. So, um, I, you know, there was this drug available and for me, it was kind of a no brainer. I said, you know, I'm getting this medicine years before it's on the market. So, and Moffitt is known for being just an absolutely amazing facility. So, um, yes, it was scary, but the benefits outweighed the fear, uh, outweighed the fear significantly. Um, I had a, an old roommate of mine that once said, if you want to be fearless, you have to fear less. And that has always stuck in my head. So. I love that saying, to be fearless, you have to fear less. Those are words to live by. Um, and of course, you're, you're right. There is a lot of fear that comes into this. And I want us, uh, of course, to be honest with our viewers. I'm sure that the clinical trial was just not like a vacation at the beach. I mean, I'm sure there were some challenges. Was there anything specific for you, Melissa, in the trial that was uh, specifically challenging or something that you just didn't like? Um, well, I will say the blood draw was, <laughs> it was a little bit... Um, more than I had originally anticipated, but um, the staff there was so great and you know, we got through it and I would do it a hundred times again if it means that I never have to face this again. So the benefits outweigh the risks and all the, you know, I mean, most cancer patients by the time they would get to a clinical trial have already been poked and prodded so much. So at the, at the end of the day, I was like, you know, what's another, what's another blood draw? Like, let's just get through it. Let's power through it and, you know, get the drugs that I want to get, so. 
I mean, you, you were, um, well, brave. I mean, we talk about being courageous at Moffitt all the time, and it's a very brave step to do that. Um, what advice would you give to another breast cancer patient who's considering a, a clinical trial? What would you say to them? Go for it. Do it. Um, you know, it was, you know, I will say that if there was a placebo involved, I don't know that I would have been as um, gung-ho to do it, but because I knew I was getting one of two drugs that have both been proven to be very effective in phase one, um, I did a lot of research, you know, and, you know, Dr. Han and Moffitt and the whole team over there really gave me, um, you know, a good amount of information to kind of show the success in phase one. So I knew either way I was getting one of two really successful drugs. So for me, it was kind of a no brainer. I said, you know what, let's, let's do this. And, and one final question for you, Melissa, is, is how are you doing now? Where are you in your treatment? What, what is your diagnosis? If I can ask. Um, as of December 31st, I have had my last surgery. Um, I am done with the initial phase for my um, breast cancer vaccination. And I have three boosters, um, March, June, and September. And then I am officially done and closing this book entirely. And um, I will never look back on it. That's my goal. So that's fantastic. Congratulations. And I think if anybody deserves an actual honeymoon, it's you after, after going through all of that. Uh, well, uh, that if, just, COVID would, uh, if COVID would stop jumping in on that, um, our our honeymoon will happen. We're just waiting for it to be safe for us to travel. So Right, right. Safe. And, and now that you're healthy, you can do that. that that's awesome. And, and and we do have some some more questions that have come through through, through Facebook. And um, um, anybody can answer these, but because uh, I'm not sure who would know. Most of them are about uh, current trials that, that are going on. Um, uh, Lulu asked us if there was a trial that uh, we have um, for triple negative breast cancer to prevent a recurrence. Um, is, do we have any trials like that? And what does that look like? I don't know if Dr. Solomon or Dr. Han, one of you wanted to take those? Yeah, um, well, for, for preventing a recurrence, um, we're we're actually uh, looking to open a, an investigator initiated study fairly soon that we want to kind of highlight, uh, which is in part based in, on the technology that Melissa had participated in too for her vaccination. And what it is, is it's going to be a vaccine that will be targeting a, an additional protein for women with triple negative breast cancer. And it's gonna, going to be given alongside their standard treatment in the preoperative setting to see if we can basically make the chemotherapy work better and make it more effective at completely eradicating the tumor um, and, and hopefully re preventing recurrence. So this is a brand new trial actually that's in the process of opening up that we hope to have up and running uh, within the next few months. And uh, that's something that she would want to keep an eye out for. I think if, if uh, you know, she's um, interested because potentially we are looking at seeing if we can use these vaccines as well for women at risk with triple negative disease who may have had prior treatment, but may be at risk for a recurrence. Um, and so that's been some of the discussions that we've been having as a group to have these kind of trials for women like that. Now, I, I, we've talked a lot about clinical trials, and I know there's several that are on, ongoing. Um, you may not have an exact number for this, but how many breast cancer clinical trials are typically going on at the same time at Moffitt. Is there a number that you can share? Um, either Dr. Solomon or Dr. Han, is there a 10, 20? I have no idea. Active trials that's open and occurring patient in breast program at given time would be about 15 plus somewhere there. I mean, there are many, many more trials that are open that some of those patients are on follow-up and we see what happened to those patients. but actively open to um, you know, accruer, that's probably about the number given time, 15 plus to 20. Okay, and, and I know that the, the, the word in, in cancer world um, over the past few years has been immunotherapy and CAR T cell therapy. Um, uh, Wendy uh, is wondering, is the CAR T program open yet? For, for uh... So basically we have a dedicated program at Moffitt. It's called the ICE-T for short. So it's our uh, immune cellular therapy uh, team. And they actually have a dedicated unit in the hospital that specializes in the administration of CAR T cells and other types of uh, what we would call adoptive immunotherapies. Uh, and we have a whole infrastructure built up around 
the collection and processing of these cells and shipping them to various labs in order to produce them. And so there are a number of trials that we have open through this service um, that are treating patients with both hematologic malignancies and solid tumors. Uh, now, the trials for breast cancer using these types of treatments are still relatively few and, and far in between because it is a little bit more difficult to treat solid tumors with these kind of uh, treatments as opposed to the kind of responses that we've seen with the uh, patients with hematologic malignancies. But there are some interesting and exciting developments that are on the horizon that may make these treatments more effective for patients with solid tumors like breast cancer. And we are hoping to open one trial or two in the future as well, in the next few months. It's not CAR-T, but it's using the immunotherapy called the adaptive T-cell therapy for positive metastatic breast cancer patients that we are using with another new medication called pepinemab, and then using this T-cell adaptive therapy, essentially you collect the cells from the patient and modify it and uniquely engineer them and then inject that to the patient along with other treatment that potentially uh, make differences for her to pass the metastatic breast cancer therapy. So we are actually hoping to open this trial in the next few months as well that uh, we are finishing to write off and then send it to FDA. So there are many movement, moving parts that um, incorporating this new novel approach that's been successful for many other diseases, that also we are part of those um, advancements in breast cancer field as well. I think that's an important fact to remember is that there are, it, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like there are always more trials coming available um, in the breast cancer program. Because um, we have a lot of questions, it looks like, in our Facebook feed now about specific breast cancer trials. So for example, Joan is wondering, is there a trial for cryoablation of stage one breast cancer. Um, is, is, there, is that a trial available and is there information on our website about that? We don't have a cryoablation trial open right now. We, we did have a recent study where we were injecting tumors with uh, either certain engineered viruses that would destroy the tumor or with immune uh, basically agents that were being given alongside the chemo in order to try to stimulate the immune system. Um, but we currently don't have a cryoablation uh, trial open. And, uh, but, you know, again, it's an interesting uh, thought, you know, is that some of these local therapies um, actually may stimulate the immune system to attack the tumor when they're frozen or uh, treated with radiation therapy before removal. And, and, and again, there, there's so many questions when it comes to clinical trials and treatment in, in general. And, and I wanted to bring Vivian uh, back into the conversation. Um, I know you said you did a lot of these uh, educational events, uh, virtual now, of course. Um, but in your experience uh, surrounding the subject of clinical trials, what are some of the more common questions that patients ask you about clinical trials? Well, after I go over the the, fun, the basics of what clinical trials are, the, I would say that the number one question is, does it cost any money? Um, and do I have to participate? Is it mandatory that I participate? So those are two main questions that I emphasize the answer when obviously come up. And definitely, no, this is a total voluntary event. Uh, the patient has the right to decline uh, a clinical trial. And even after signing the informed consent and being part of the trial, they can actually withdraw at any time. I, I always suggest not to stop coming to the trial just out of the blue, but to consult with the coordinator and their doctor prior to withdrawing, just in case for health issues. Um, and in regards to cost, well, there's always uh, that uh, possibility of having extra cost. But I always re remind them that uh, if you have insurance, you're always responsible for co-payments and your deductible. But in addition to those, there may be some calls that the, possibly the coordinator of the trial and the doctor may be able to answer. Thank, thank you for sharing that. I know everybody loves dealing with insurance. It's everybody's favorite subject, I know. So, um, but, th but that's good advice. You know, check with your insurance to see what it will, what it will cost you. Now, we've talked a lot about 
um, you know, treatment of, of people with advanced uh, stages of cancer. Um, and and Louisian has a good question on Facebook. Um, are there any trials um, that are focused on like pre-cancer, like clinical trials that help prevent um, cancer from even forming? Is, is that something we look at? I'm seeing nods from Dr. Han and Dr. Solomon. Dr. Han, can you answer that question? Mafit, we have one trial. Um, um, is that uh, using it's actually part of NIH? It's Mafit is one of the center participating in this multi center um, trials, essentially evaluating something that we use in clinical setting called the tamoxifen. That's actually estrogen blocker we use for patients to prevent breast cancer or to to develop breast cancers in many different ways. So tamoxifen is approved for many different indications. And, but obviously there are many toxicities like blood clot or even day-to-day -day menopausal symptoms. Because of that uptake of tamoxifen use for patients who are high risk but not having breast cancer is very low. Most women do not want to take the medication to prevent or to get the breast cancer. So what we are actually doing it is that there, there has to be a development of, instead of a pill tamoxifen, it's gels. So essentially they, are, they apply to their breast and skin and it gets absorbed to the breast. And then we are researching to see how that can improve or change breast sensory. So we're looking to see dense breast is risk factor to develop breast cancer. One of others also, you know, are there, but so this specific clinical trial is designed at least to see for patient with high breast density, but without history of breast cancer, when they get mammogram and MOFIT, that we identify those patients and ask them if they want to participate to get this tamoxifen gels on their breast to see if that change breast density and potentially translating into preventing breast cancer in the future. So this is one of the studies that's ongoing at Moffitt. And, and of course, screening is so important. And I know Moffitt has a big campaign uh, every October and throughout the year to encourage uh, women and, and men, if necessary, to get those screenings. Um, I wanted to add, uh, shift this back to, to Melissa uh, briefly, uh, bring you back into the conversation. Um, you didn't really talk about how you discovered your breast cancer, but I was curious, had you had experience with breast cancer before and did, did you undergo regular screenings? Um, actually, so I did start getting mammograms at 35 um, to, you know, because I did have dense breasts and I was more predisposed. Um, and ironically, you know, the reality is I didn't miss an exam and I switched doctors and my new doctor was like, whoa, something's not, so we need to get a mammogram today. So um, ignorance is not always bliss. Um, and if I can give anybody, any women listening to this right now, if, if something doesn't seem right, push for answers, get a second opinion. Um, you know, just look, just, you know, it just, just dig for those answers. Um, and I'm very thankful for my doctor who did my annual exam and sent me for mammogram that same day because she definitely saved my life. Uh, and, and that's huge. And like you said, we, we know our own bodies. You know your own body. If something doesn't seem right, feel right, uh, dig for those answers. And uh, Melissa, you sound like you're a, a big researcher. So I'm sure that you really don't need to figure <laughs> out what you need to do. Um, uh, again, we're, we're getting some more questions that are coming in about specific trials. Um, um, and but before I dive into those, um, I'm I'm just curious: Are trials specific to the stage of of cancer that you're diagnosed with, or um, or, or not? I'm seeing that nodding heads. Dr. Solomon, could you answer that for me? Yeah. So as as Dr. Han was was clarifying earlier in her comments about the types of trials that we have, uh, there are trials that are specifically designed to try to look see if a treatment's effective when a woman has had a recurrence that is metastasized or spread elsewhere in her body. And so those trials are, are basically set up in a way to recruit those patients. But then we have trials that are focused on women with disease that has been diagnosed initially, but has not metastasized. And we're treating with curative intent. So she mentioned one of the trials was uh, like our iSpy trial, which tries to test a lot of different novel drugs to be given to a woman prior to surgery. And we have trials like uh, Dr. Han had uh, mentioned that are looking at the pre-cancer stage as well. So 
uh, across the spectrum, we're trying to have a portfolio of different trials to service the needs of our various patient populations across the spectrum of stage and also subtypes of breast cancer. So hormone receptor positive, triple negative, HER2 positive. That's how we try to organize the portfolio. And Dr. Han is in charge of the research portfolio within the breast department so that when we meet together as a group, we're trying to plan out the portfolio to see that whether it meets the needs of our patients across that entire spectrum. Same. And, and, uh, and briefly, uh, again, we, we have questions about specific trials. Um, so, so I guess Dr. Solomon or Dr. Han, if you could just answer briefly um, this quick list of questions, because I don't want to take up uh, too much more of your time. Um, but uh, Jennifer is asking, are there clinical trials for stage four PRER plus HER2? Hopefully I read that right. <laughs> uh, are there uh, clinical trials specific to that? And see any yes from Dr. Solomon. Um, and, and again, a lot of this information is on moffitt.org. If you search under clinical trials, you can see which, which ones are available. Uh, Michelle is asking uh, if the HER2 vaccine trial is available for stage four. So we don't yet um, have the uh, um, metastatic trial. I mean, you know, we are more focused on vaccine trial for obviously all these stage patients like Melissa is participating, it's currently open to accrual. So we have this dendritic cell vaccine trial for patients with neoadjuvant setting and adjuvant setting means that all these stage patients with heart positive breast cancer can be treated before surgery or after surgery. Uh, but um, we are designing, like I uh, mentioned earlier, that T-cell adaptive therapy that trial actually incorporated uh, the same dendritic cell vaccine with investigational agent as well. Um, so that combination of to boost the immune system and treat cancer for you know, metastatic stage. So we are hoping to open that trial in the very near future. And, and I, I, of course, heard you say uh, metastatic stage, and we are getting questions about metastatic uh, breast cancer. Um, so there are, if I understood you correctly, Dr. Han, there are trials specific to stage four metastatic breast cancer. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and that uh, we had a, a Kim who was watching and, and asked that question. And uh, Carrie had a similar question. Um, if there are any trials for metastatic hormone positive HER2 negative breast cancer um, uh, other than uh, AI so that it never comes back. Um, again, there's so many specific trials. Is there one for that one as well? We have a very a few trials in regards to that, about three clinical trials with stage four hormone receptor positive heart negative breast cancer patient, because those are majority of patients with metastatic breast cancer are living with metastatic breast cancer day to day. So we are trying to get a lot of trial for patients who are fighting for that. So we have some new anti-estrogen therapy beyond the aromatase inhibitor, or like typical tamoxifen or fluvestrone. So we have a new generation of oral pill, it's a medication that's taken by pill, uh, investigating a new anti-estrogen therapy. And then we have medication that's using targeted therapy called the CDK7 inhibitor that's combined with the fluvestrone, that's endocrine therapy. And then we have another clinical trial specifically looking for patients who has FGFR1 or 2 amplification that can be found from anal analyzing tumor samples. And those patients can come on the trial as well. So we have about three plus clinical trials currently. Okay. And, and uh, one, one final question the, before we wrap up here. I can't believe 45 minutes has blown by already. Uh, but, but Dr. Solomon, uh, I was wondering if you could kind of uh, give me a, uh, an example, um, of course not specific, but an example of, of what a conversation would be like for you uh, with a patient that you believe would be right for a clinical trial. Um, like what kind of questions would that patient um, get from you uh, and what would drive you to say, yes, the clinical trial is right for you. Can you give me an example of that? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Stephen. I think it emphasizes an earlier point as to how do we speak to patients about trials because ultimately what a patient is looking for is uh, to build a, a relationship and a rapport with that provider so that they get a sense that the provider's taken the time and the effort to really understand what is going on with them and what the particular details that are relevant about their breast cancer are so that when the provider 
ask a question, for example, when, when you were diagnosed, do you recall what type of breast cancer you had? Uh, do you have the records? Do you have any information about the stage that you're at or what scans you've had? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what treatments you've already been on? Have you, have you been treated for your breast cancer already? Right? And by putting that picture together, what you can do then is begin to come uh, to the patient with a, a uh, justification, if you will, or an explanation as to why you think a particular study is the right fit for them. And the better you are at doing that and explaining it to them in clear, easy to understand terms, the more likely the patient will, will accept your recommendation because you're building that trust and that rapport with them. If you're talking over their head or using a lot of technical jargon, or you're not really putting the pieces of the puzzle together the right way, you start to lose their confidence, right? And so that's really what's critical. If you wanna have the information in front of the physician, make sure that the physician's asking the right questions you know, uh, to understand what's going on. And then you have to basically put it in layman's terms. You have to put it in terms that the patient can understand as to why that trial is right for them. That's how my discussions are built up. I, I try to learn as much as I can about the patient, try to get all the facts lined up in a row and make sure that I got it correct. So I have the patient actually, you know, correct me if there's any mistakes or any kind of issues there. And once we're all on the same page, then I begin to explain and break down the trial that I think is right for them. And, and I, would, I would assume, Melissa, that as a patient, you would agree with that, that communication with the doctor and keeping things professional but simple is probably very important to help make those decisions. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when you're, you know, when you're talking about, you know, taking a drug and putting it into your body and you're not, um, you know, you know, it's not been, you know, through all the approvals, um, you're putting a lot of trust in your doctors and, you know, you have just an amazing team over at Moffitt that, you know, stands behind these things and does all that research to get, to build that confidence and, and to help us, you know, as patients feel comfortable, you know, going through these trials. Um, Dr. Han was just really informative. She answered all my questions and, and, you know, she basically laid it out in ways that I could understand it so that I felt really good about the decision I was making. All right. And, 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 and look at you now. You're doing so well. And again, I know we're, we all applaud you for that. Um, I, I want to thank you all for joining me tonight. Uh, Dr. Solomon, Dr. Han, Vivian, Melissa, uh, I appreciate you guys taking some time on a weeknight, uh, probably right after dinner, to talk with me about clinical trials. Um, I know it's an important subject. Uh, and of course, I want to thank everybody who listened in on Facebook Live and who are listening in at the recorded version of this as well. Um, hopefully, this conversation was able to expand your knowledge base on clinical trials at least a little bit. Um, I know it's a whole lot to take in, but that's why we have experts at Moffitt and we also have Vivian, um, who you can call directly, uh, as she said, <laughs> to ask those uh, questions, um, and of course, attend those educational events. Um, clinical trials obviously can be a huge benefit to cancer patients, and Melissa is a perfect example of that. So we ask that if you are a breast cancer patient to please discuss uh, the options of clinical trials with your doctor to see if it's a form of treatment that could benefit you. Uh, you heard some examples of what those questions and what that conversation could look like. If you don't understand what your doctor is saying to you, don't hesitate to ask them to use layman's terms. If I understood anything Dr. Solomon said, it was that uh, speak, on, uh, speak uh, directly and simply so that you know exactly what to expect. Um, I also want to mention that uh, feedback is important at Moffitt Cancer Center, and we will actually be sending out surveys to everyone who participated in this evening's uh, uh, Facebook Live event. Uh, so we ask that you take a brief moment to, uh, to complete that. Um, and also stay tuned to the Moffitt Facebook page for news of our next Facebook Live event coming in March. That one will focus on genetic testing and high-risk patients. Um, and of course, you can also visit Moffitt.org for more information as well on the Breast Cancer Clinic. Um, so if you do want to learn more or you know of somebody who wants to learn more about uh, genetic testing and high-risk patients, please direct them to the Moffitt Facebook page and please follow us. So that is all from us this evening. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Solomon, Dr. Han, Vivian, and Melissa for joining me tonight. Uh, on behalf of Moffitt, I'm Steve Blanchard, and I want to thank you for tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.